This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? He's an oil scientist. They I it felt, felt, felt right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Margaret Geller. The story was recorded in May 2014 at the Davis Square Theater in Somerville, Massachusetts, as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. I grew up in the Sputnik era. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched a tiny satellite. All it did was go bleep, but that scared the United States into a vast investment in physics research and physics education. Things looked bright for people who were interested in studying the physical sciences, and my father, who was a scientist, encouraged me to become a scientist. By 1970, when I graduated from the University of California at Berkeley with a degree in physics, the promise was over. The United States invaded Cambodia that spring. There was no graduation ceremony at Berkeley for fear of violent demonstrations. Science budgets were steeply cut. Graduate schools were decreasing their enrollments. People with PhDs in physics were driving taxicabs. In that depressing environment, I was thinking about applying to graduate school in physics. With the odd wisdom of a 22-year-old, I applied to only two graduate schools, Berkeley and Princeton. I knew I would be admitted to Berkeley, but Princeton was another matter. For one thing, a woman had never received a PhD in physics from Princeton. For another, Princeton was the most competitive graduate school in the country, and still is, so admission there was rather uncertain. I decided that I would let where I was admitted decide what I would do. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and that if I went to Princeton, I would do astrophysics. I didn't know anything about it. But I thought, when I read about what people were doing at Princeton, that it was fascinating. People were talking about a telescope in space, and those ideas are the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see the beautiful images on the web. Look at them when you go home, if you've never looked at them before. So that was how I made my uh, decision. And the people at Princeton were leaders, and the idea of doing astrophysics appe appealed to my sense of wonder and my romantic idea about how physics might be applied. My first introduction to Princeton was a pink slip in my mailbox. It said, happy news from Princeton. Call John Wheeler. <laughs> I was amazed. I knew who John Wheeler was. He had worked on the Manhattan Project, and after that, he turned his attention to applying Einstein's theory of general relativity to a wide variety of problems in astrophysics, from the nature of black holes to the nature of the universe itself. I called. A soft voice answered the phone and said, welcome to Princeton. It seemed very odd. He didn't even ask me if I was coming. He didn't ask me if I'd admit it anywhere else. <laughs> Just, welcome to Princeton. And then he said, my wife Jeanette and I would be very pleased 
if you would visit us on our island off the coast of Maine before you go to Princeton. <laughs> Not everybody owns an island, but they did. <laughs> so that September, I flew to Bangor, Maine. A trim man with very intense eyes met me at the gate. It was a foggy night, and as we drove toward the coast, the fog became thicker and thicker until the visibility was less than a car length. The car was driving, Wheeler was driving, straddling the white line as we entered the causeway to the island. And he turned to me and said, when I was 10, I blew off the end of my finger with a cherry bomb. When I was 20, I worked on the A-bomb. When I was 30, I worked on the H-bomb. And now, I'm working on the Big Bang. <laughs> I was speechless, as I was many times in conversations with John Wheeler. And inside, I thought, I'm in the car with a madman. <laughs> and why isn't he looking at the road? <laughs> After 15 minutes, it seemed like an hour, we finally arrived at the Wheeler compound. Wheeler showed me to a small rustic cabin. I was exhausted and I dropped into bed only to realize I wasn't alone. There was a gnawing noise coming from the porch. When I went out to investigate, I found a porcupine busily reducing the support for the porch. <laughs> the sight of this bizarre animal, and it was the first time I'd ever seen one, completed the surreal feel <laughs> of the evening. I was so exhausted, though, that I went to sleep. Once I knew it was a porcupine, I was able to sleep. The morning dawned bright and fresh. It was a very clear morning, and Jeanette Wheeler came to greet me and take me on a tour of the island. The first stop was the crest of the island, and on the crest was a Civil War cannon, painted bright pink. <laughs> Jeanette pointed across the exquisite bay and said, see over there? The Kennedys live over there. <laughs> Once a year, we shoot the cannon. <laughs> and we shoot it at them. <laughs> we don't have much use for them. My stomach churned. I thought, what am I doing here? I wanted to leave, but there was no place to go. So I followed Jeanette to the breakfast room where Wheeler was already seated with his other students. The breakfast was pleasant, the conversation was light, and after breakfast, it was my turn to talk to Wheeler, sitting on a porch overlooking the ocean. I had never heard anyone talk about physics the way Wheeler did. The poetry just spilled out of him. It was like magic. He talked in pictures. He said, matter shapes the geometry of space, and the geometry of space tells matter how to move. How exquisitely clear anybody could understand it. The complete content of Einstein's theory of general relativity. He went on to explain how space is strongly warped around black holes and to talk about the stretching space of the vast universe we inhabit. And for the first time in my life, I began to wonder, what did the universe look like? What were the continents and oceans of the universe? Nobody knew. And how would you find out? Wheeler showed me that it was fine to think big. It was okay 
to think in pictures. And there was nothing wrong with being romantic about our ability to understand nature. Wheeler was a showman. Physics was theater for him. When he lectured at Princeton, he wrote with carefully chosen colored chalks. He was ambidextrous. He would start with his left hand and continue seamlessly with his right. A few months after I arrived at Princeton, he decided it was time to tell me about the project he would like me to work on. He chose theater for this too. He invited me to lunch at PJ's Pancake House on Nassau Street across from the main university campus. We got there, he sat down across from me and looked at the menu and ordered himself the largest possible stack of pancakes. When it arrived, he looked at me intensely, cut into his stack of pancakes and said, I would like you to work on the fragmentation of neutron pancakes. <laughs> For the life of me, I couldn't understand where such a thing might be in the universe. <laughs> the more I thought about it, the less I understood it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that Wheeler had shown me the way to something that really fascinated me, but he wasn't going there. So I decided to go talk to somebody else who was going there, a much younger scientist, Jim Peebles. Peebles was thinking about the way that galaxies are distributed, and the new galaxies like our own Milky Way are distributed in the universe. And he was making the first attempts to really understand how the distribution gets that way and how galaxies are made. So I went to talk to Jim, and I was very fortunate that he agreed to supervise my thesis. I was very shy about telling Wheeler that I had decided not to work with him and to work with Peebles. I was shy because in some way I felt that Wheeler cared about me in some odd way and he'd been very, very kind to me. But finally I got up my courage and went to his office and I was very surprised by the response. So I told him I wanted to work with Jim and he said, good man, he's changing the way we understand the universe. And he looked at me with a soft smile. And when I think of that smile, I wonder whether he understood what I would ultimately do. I did work with Peebles. And during my graduate work, I used the then existing data, and it was a very small amount of data, to examine the nearest 1 100 millionth of the universe. There were no patterns to be discovered at that point. We could measure how much matter there was in every volume of the universe at some level, very inaccurately, but that was about it. I'm very fortunate that I came of age in science when we first became able to map the universe. In the mid-1980s, my colleagues and I mapped a slice of the universe much deeper than the data that I was able to analyze when I was a student. And those data uncovered the largest patterns we know in nature. They showed that galaxies like our own are distributed in extraordinary patterns. They lie in thin structures that surround or nearly surround vast empty regions completely devoid of galaxies. These patterns extend for hundreds of millions of light years, and we were the very first to see them. Today, we can use much larger telescopes and fancier instruments to view the distant universe. The universe is, in some sense, a time machine. As we look out in space, we look back in time, so the entire history of the universe is there for us to see. So as we map the more and more distant universe, we can see directly how the patterns we discovered evolved. In doing so, we observe ancient photons that travel to us for hundreds of millions, or billions of years. They don't hit anything until they arrive in our telescopes 
and we interpret them to understand the universe. This project is the project that still fascinates me, and I'm fortunate to have access to instruments that I can use to make this kind of exploration. Twenty years after I received my PhD from Princeton, I was walking along the sidewalk, Logan Airport, and I saw a familiar figure. I raced toward John Wheeler. He looked up and said, Hi, Margaret, just as though we planned to meet. <laughs> he said, I've been following your work. The maps are fundamental and so beautiful. It's all about gravity. I said, I'm so honored. You inspired me. There were tears in my eyes, and I think there was a glint in his as he got into the limo that took him to High Island. I never saw Wheeler again, although he lived to be 97. But I carry, I think, a small piece of him inside me in the fascination that I have with applying physics to a universe we can understand but never touch. Thank you. That was Margaret Geller. Margaret is an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She's best known for her pioneering 3D maps of the distribution of galaxies in the nearby universe. She's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has received a MacArthur Fellowship and many other prestigious awards. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love the podcast, please consider donating storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Davis Square Theater for hosting the show, to the Cambridge Science Festival for being amazing, and to Galaxies and Island Canons for going together. Thanks for listening. <laughs>